Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, I'm Simon. I'm from ICMAT here. I work with uh, David, Nuria, Pablo, and all of these people here. And I'm going to be presenting chapter four of the book today. Uh, just uh, I know that it's been a long time since the last session, so I'm just going to remind you briefly what each previous chapter was about. Uh, just touch on it. So uh, we are all in the in the same page uh, to to begin with. So if you remember in the first chapter, I'm not going to go into like details. You have the, the videos in YouTube. Uh, we're going to upload the, the chapter three soon. Uh, but if you remember, okay. if you remember, uh, chapter one was about giving a precise definition of a causal effect. And we also give some, some measures. And we usually talk about causal effects when the potential outcomes differ, uh, when you have a potential treatment of a person and the, the outcome of that potential treatment would be different than the one that you observed actually in the in the real experiment. So we also gave some measures about causal effects, such as uh, causal risk difference or causal risk ratio, which uh, were two different ways of uh, characterizing uh, causal effects. And uh, in chapter two, we continue the, the argumentation given in chapter one as a way to consistently estimate uh, causal effects from randomized experiments. So the ideal randomized experiments uh, provide you a way uh, to consistently estimate causal effects because you can identify or you can consistently estimate uh, these, these risks or these um, potential outcomes from just the randomization of the experiment. And the core idea here it's just to make uh, the, the missing data appear randomly so it balances out somehow. And this is true for randomized experiments, but as uh, we already mentioned in chapter three already, um, here in observational experiments, you don't usually have this uh, type of luxury. And this is the most common type of experiments that you conduct in science because you cannot do like a full uh, randomized experiment. Maybe it's unethical. For example, the, the typical uh, case that we discuss of the heart transplant, maybe you cannot, well, no. Of course, you cannot do a uh, heart transplant randomly. Uh, you're not going to get past the, the ethics committee anyhow if you just do a heart transplant to a healthy person. And you tend to save the hearts that you have, which are scarce uh, to the people that need it. So observa observational experiments are uh, quite the norm, I would say, in, in science. And in order to make use of observational experiments, you most of the time need uh, three things, which we discussed uh, were like um, uh, really requirements in order to use an observational experiment as if it was a randomized experiment. And the three conditions we needed were uh, positivity. Uh, so you have people that receive every different treatment, if you remember. So you cannot have, uh, for example, 100% of the population receiving one treatment and then uh, none receiving another, which wouldn't allow you to determine the effect of that uh, treatment. Uh, you also have ex exchangeability. So that means that if you would, uh, if you were to exchange two populations, the results of the treating each of those populations would be uh, interchangeable. So it's indistinguishable somehow. And you also had um, positivity, exchangeability, and consistency. So the, the effect you observe after a treatment is the, the same as the potential outcome for that treatment. So if you think about the potential outcome of treating this population with treatment A, uh, for example, if you talk about the conducting a heart transplant on a population, uh, the potential outcome of conducting that experiment on that population is the same as if you do it for real. So you have to have this consistency. And there were some caveats as well. So if you remember, uh, you have to keep in mind that you don't have multiple versions of the treatment, uh, that the treatment uh, doesn't have different effects uh, depending on the population you apply. Uh, also, you have to have um, uh, no, um, I think the name was interference. Uh, so treating one person doesn't affect treating a, a, another person. So this type of uh, caveats that we also mentioned, right? So that's uh, mainly what was discussed in chapter three, alongside with uh, target trials and uh, a lot of 
more details. So you can check this out in the in the video once it's uploaded to to the YouTube channel of ICMAT. Okay. And in this chapter now, uh, we're going to talk about effect modification, and this is something that is hinted about in chapter two as well. And effect modification is um, just a particular way of looking at uh, these conditional exchangeability experiments, right? So if you remember, conditional exchangeability is a type of uh, randomized experiments, if you want, but when you have like two coins, for example, like uh, if you remember uh, in the experiments, we talked about uh, conditional exchangeability in chapter four, in chapter two, there were like, um, you tend to, perform a heart surgery uh, in the people that need it the most, which may be in the severe group. And if you don't have a severe patient, you don't tend to do heart surgery as much. So uh, in that case, you had conditional exchangeability because for each strata that you had uh, in the severity prognosis, you could perform exchangeability inside, but not across groups of severity conditions, right? So when we discuss this in chapter two, uh, we discussed that there were like mainly two ways of going about it. Um, the, the second one is the one that we have dealt with. Uh, so the people in, in Zoom can see. Um, the second one was just trying to estimate the population effect uh, through uh, techniques such as standardization or inverse probability weighting. Uh, so these two techniques allow you to estimate a uh, causal effect in the whole population, uh, controlling by the variable, in this case, the severity of the of the patient, right? And we also mentioned, uh, I don't know if you remember, because it was like a, a footnote only in the in the chapter, that there were the possibility of also conducting uh, experiments using strata specific effects, and this is precisely what we're going to do uh, today. This is uh, trying to uh, study in a group uh, setting, like in a subset of the whole population, the causal effect of uh, a given treatment. So let me grab so it So you do it just for uh, each uh, strategy? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're going to actually try to study causal effects in subsets of the population now, not, not the whole population. This can be interesting in some cases. It, it also depends on the, on the task that you have at hand. But in general, um, this uh, can be interesting to as, as we will see later on, to be a little bit more certain that you can extrapolate uh, conclusions from one subset of the population to another subset of the population. So we want to know, uh, for example, if um, a given treatment, for example, in, uh, for people here in Spain would work the same for people in Canada. Uh, that's uh, the type of reasoning we're going to conduct now. Uh, but of course, uh, it all depends on the question. So the actually the chapter uh, opens talking about an example uh, of a policymaker that may want to conduct a policy of uh, introducing introducing uh, fluoration in the in the water service of the city. So you may be interested in to uh, may, may be interested in knowing the the whole effect in the whole population, but. In, in specific neighborhoods, you may be interested also in knowing if they are going to be like more affected than the mean population and so on, okay? So that's uh, that depends on your inferential goals, of course. Uh, so the, the first thing is, I'm gonna push this further, I think. Uh, so the main thing here is uh, we're going to begin defining uh, effect modification. So if you remember uh, in the original uh, in, in the original uh, two sessions, well, in the third as well, we discussed uh, a lot of things using the example of the of the Greek gods, uh, right? So let, let me just quickly um, copy two or three words. So we can have a an idea. And I will explain each column in a in a second. So 
So um, this type of table is very similar to the ones we had in chapter one, when we discussed uh, things using a table that had all the potential outcomes. This is something that is generally unreasonable uh, because you don't have a table with each of them, but let's just begin with this, okay? Let's just start in the, in the simplest case. So in this case, we have, uh, we have the same setup as before. So we have the treatment. Uh, a is a heart transplant. Uh, we have the outcome, so it's potential death. And we also have this new variable here, which is going to indicate it's just a, it's a, it's just a marker for the sex of the god in this case. Okay, so we uh, write one when the god is a female, and we write zero when it's a, it's a male. Okay, and the, the table is the same table as before, but just separating uh, ones with, uh, with zeros as well. So as we saw, I think it was chapter two, or maybe I'm, I'm mistaken, but we saw that the that the average causal effect in this case was null. In, in general, we saw that for the whole population, we had the causal risk difference was equal to zero, and the causal risk ratio was equal to one, right? We have these two things. So it means that we don't have a, a causal effect for the whole population. But now we can try to answer the question of, does it affect differently the, the female gods and the male gods? And if so, how does it affect differently? So we can try to do this just by splitting the, effectively what we are doing here is splitting the table right down the middle and separating the zeros and the ones in the column V and just performing analysis on each of those strata, okay? So we're just separating, completely separating the data and performing causal analysis in, in both cases. And if you do the math, for example, in the female dots, uh, yeah, I'm going to write it down here, so we are. So if you write it down for V equal one, you end up with, uh, I'm just going to skip the math, but 1.5 and because of its difference is 0.2 and for e, v equals zero, you end up with the exact opposite thing. So this is two thirds and because of risk difference is minus 0.2, right? So this is a, Pretty particular case because in this instance, particular instance again, uh, you have the whole population with a no causal effect, but for each of the two populations, you have a non no uh, causal effect that they cancel each other out in the whole population. So you see that for each subset of the population, you have different effects. In the female gods, the treatment helps, uh, well, increases the probability of death, so it doesn't help precisely. Uh, and in the in the male gods, uh, it helps with the probability of death, so it's lower in this case. Now the thing is, since in the database we have, I think it was twenty gods, and we have an uh, exact split, ten and ten uh, female and male gods, and since the the two effects are with the equal uh, magnitude in both cases, they cancel each other out. So this is the weird instance in this case, but you can expect in general. Uh, heterogeneity between groups. So you can expect differences, but in general, not just cancellation between them. So this is a particular instance, but this uh, effect of having different, uh, different causal effects for different subsets of the, of the population is something to be expected again. Now, in this case, uh, well, let me just write it down. doesn't imply it. Okay, so this is just... Uh, uh, do, they, uh, do they talk in the chapter about Simpson's paradox? Or? Not, not precisely, yeah. 
Uh, they, they will introduce it later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is highly related to that, of course. This is the first thing I, I thought about when, when reading this chapter, but not yet. I think it's uh, for maybe the two next chapters or something like this. Yeah, but it's really, really related with that, to that. Um, so in general, uh, let me just... Uh, so we say that V is an, let me just summarize, effect modifier of, of the effect of A on Y if uh, the average causal effect of A on Y varies across the strata, right? So that is the definition of a, an effect modifier. So we have a variable that uh, when you separate the group uh, into different strata, it modifies the effect of a treatment in a given population, right? Now, V is an effect modifier, but it's important uh, that we take into account that the definition of effect modifier depends on the measure selected. So, because average causal effect, which I'm summarizing here as well, abbreviating in, in just uh, ACE, uh, the average causal effect can be uh, defined by different metrics, right? So we, for example, we have the causal risk difference and the causal risk ratio. And it may be the case that you have one without the other. That may be the case is not uh, impossible. Again, it's not very common, but you can have this as well. So just to make sure that we are precisely finding this, you have to take into account uh, the measure. So this is usually measure depending. Uh, in general, you talk about uh, an effect modifier depending on a measure, right? And you also have to be aware of the fact that V cannot be affected by A, by the treatment A. So B, uh, V cannot be a variable that depends on the actual treatment, right? Because if, if it does, then it beats the whole purpose, right? In this case. So uh, being mindful of, so, uh, especially this one over here, in the book, what they what they define afterwards is just uh, additive effect modification and multiplicative effect modification. Yeah? And if you can just guess uh, how it's going to work, uh, you have. Let me just push this a little bit. So additive effect modification is going to be uh, just the difference. Well, no. They they only define it as a as an inequality in this case. It's not equal to the same thing for the other strata. This is in the case of a binary variable. Of course, you can do this for other cases on which you don't have uh, the binary case, and just for each of the strata that you have in in V, right? So this is additive, and uh, as you can imagine, multiplicative effect modification goes the same way, but in this case, you're using the, the uh, causal risk ratio in this case. So you can imagine this as well. Uh, maybe I, sorry. Okay. So, so this is just a definition, right? And you can have uh, additive effect modification without the multiplicative and vice versa. You can also define this with the, um, 
causal odds ratio, if you want, the, the, the third metric that we also define in chapter one, I think. But it's usually not provided because it doesn't, it, it's not that clear. In this case, you can interpret uh, both of these things pretty easily. So in this case, for example, you see that um, the causal risk difference in this case is a 0.2. So that means something that, that means the difference of the probability of death is 0.2 larger in this case, and it is 0.2 smaller. But if you provide the uh, the odds ratio here, it's not so easily interpretable. You can also do it, but in most cases, and also if you have multiple strata of V, it's more confusing. So they specifically uh, mentioned that you should try to provide a multiplicative or a specially, if you can, additive effect modification, which is in most cases more interpretable. Okay. Could you, uh, uh, could you do also, I mean, the first one is easy because you, you can, it's, it's additive, right? Right. But could you consider the expected of the risk ratio given V equals one? The expected of the risk uh, ratio? So uh, why so the expected of the oh you you mean the expect yeah. uh, the expectance of the, the yeah. quotient yeah i guess so yes yeah. yeah. you can define different measures i mean this is just two of them but you if you're interested in that thing you can also do it yeah but i think if we do the expected value of the ratio we get into trouble if we then have different strata over which we are sure. competing the right. verification i think they explained that like it's uh, earlier on Mm -hmm. where they actually define it as <clears throat> not the expected value of the ratio, but the ratio of the expected values and explain why they do it mm -hmm. when you compute weighted averages of the strata. Yeah, I think you have you have to have uh, uh, you have to be a little bit careful here in the in the quotients of the expected values here. But uh, maybe you can do something related to that if you're interested in that kind of thing. But uh, I, I would use this in general. So this is also the like the Two most popular by by far uh, measures of uh, certification measures in, in this case. So um, they they also provide an example uh, which uh, I can reproduce, but maybe we can do it if if we have a little bit more time. But uh, you can see different examples on which you have uh, additive uh, effect modification and uh, not the other and vice versa. Okay. So they provide a precise example in the in the book, but just with a contact background. So we're not going to go into much detail. So uh, the thing is, stratification can be used for a lot of things, right? Uh, this thing that we have done is using stratification to try to, in this case, uh, find an effect modification by a variable, right? So they formalize this a little bit further. So let me just... Um, right, so in order to use certification uh, to identify um, an effect modification, you have to uh, use this uh, alongside standardization and or uh, inverse probability weighting, as you, as you will see in a second. So in this case, um, they define stratification as uh, the causal effect of uh, a treatment A on the outcome Y computed at each stratum of B, right? This is the, the thing we were talking about before. So the thing is, we have been able uh, to do this in general because we have this table over here. And this table had all the counterfactuals. And this is unreasonable, as we discussed. So we should be able to perform a certification without having all of the counterfactuals. We have uh, with all of the missing data that we would have generally, because we don't observe the, the counterfactuals. We only have the observation once a person is selected a treatment, right? So this is where you will need all of those techniques that we discussed in, in chapter two. Now, they discuss two uh, specific points. Uh, so the first one is referring to uh, the marginal or marginally randomized 
experiments. Right. And this is the case that we had in the in the random experiments of the chapter two, right? Uh, so in this case, since we don't have conditionally randomized experiments, you can use the same measures that we had before to estimate all of the counterfactuals in a consistent way, right? And in thanks to the to the randomization, uh, you have exchangeability in the whole population, so you can obtain uh, consistently every every counterfactual, and in this case, thanks to exchangeability again, you have things like this. Which is, uh, well, by, well, this is equal to the second line just by exchangeability. Right? So this is true by exchangeability in a fully randomized experiment with no conditionally randomization in this case. So the only thing we're doing is uh, since we have a fully randomized experiment, we are identifying each uh, counterfactual here, conditioned uh, or stratified counterfactual, if you want, with its uh, counterpart in uh, conditional, uh, conditional probabilities in this case. These are consistent estimators of the counterfactuals uh, in, the, in the overhead line, right? We're only in the same page. Sorry. The two terms in the, in the first line, they are the same. I mean, they are written to be the same. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I yeah, yeah. Mistake over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. The other thing was just wrong. Okay. Is, it, is everybody okay? Right. So this is the, the thing that you have to do in this case. This is the simplest case as, as we had in chapter two. So the main problem comes when you have uh, conditionally random experiments, but you can guess what you're going to do. Like uh, you're going to use the same techniques we used, uh, used before, but stratified in this case. So conditioned in a, in a third variable in V equal one, V equal zero, of course, you can do the same thing here, but for V equal zero, okay. It's the same. It goes the same way. Now, uh, let me just do this. So for uh, conditionally, let me, no, let me just do something. Let me just erase this thing right here. Start, start a new. <laughs> I mean, this is a formula that I would reach without even reading the chapter. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, right. thus far, it's not nothing too complex, I think. Yeah. So I have a silly question. Yeah. yeah. So you just wrote things in terms of the probability of y being equal to 1. Right. But on so, far, so far, we've been using the expected value of y. I mean, I understand you can switch from one to the other. Yeah. But is there any underlying reason why we are now switching to probability or is it just no 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 just a matter of convenience yeah 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 so we could have just written the yeah, yeah. value of y and everything would be yes better. yes 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 you can, you can do the same thing with expected values here yeah yeah okay. yeah, yeah you can you can do the same thing uh and yeah you can also do it i'm doing y equal one but you can do y equal zero whatever level uh, that's that's okay as well uh and the second part is uh, just conditionally randomized experiments, right? So the, the counterpart of that. So in conditional randomized uh, experiments, they start with an example, right? So imagine that you have the, the example from before of the gods, right? You have 40 people. from which uh, you have treatment A, which is the heart transplant. You have, uh, but you assign the treatment differently to people with severe prognosis and other prognosis, again. So the same uh, thing that David described in, in his chapter. So 
probability of getting the treatment A equal one uh, is um, 0.75 uh, to L equal one or severe. And the probability of getting the treatment in L equal zero is 0.5. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So this is other prognosis. This is uh, the same uh, setup that we have in, in your job. So in this case, uh, you can perform the same type of analysis that we conducted there, but conditioning on that variable. This is nothing uh, too, too uh, new, as you, as you mentioned. So this is what you would think about when you think about stratification. So in this case, uh, what they mentioned is just conducting, for example, in, in the whole population, you would do standardization or inverse probability weighting, right? But this gives you the causal effect for the whole population, which was uh, Davis chapter. And now you may want to answer what happens if you separate, for example, now we have 40 people, right? What if you, uh, because the original uh, data set we had, had 20 gods, if you remember. So now we have the uh, twice that. And that is because they're just making up a new table with the Roman gods. So we, we also have not only the Greeks, but also have the Roman gods. And I think they identify this uh, with, uh, yeah, V equal one are the Greeks. And V equal zero are the Romans. Right? So the analysis we conducted in chapter two is mainly this population right here, which was the, the original data set we have. But uh, you can conduct the analysis in this one, which is the new data set that they provide. Okay. And it's uh, pretty just doing the same thing, right? Applying a standardization on inverse priority weighting for V equal zero in this case. Because the chapter two, does it for V equal one, okay? And in this case, we observed that the average causal effect was null in, in both uh, metrics, in the risk ratio and in the risk difference, we saw that it was uh, null, right? In this case, if you analyze for V equal zero, and then you, again, apply both of these techniques here, right? You just obtain, in this case, uh, I can write down if you want. Uh, I, I mean, since we don't have the table, I'm just going to write down the causal risk difference and risk ratio, but the table is uh, present in the in the book. So the causal risk difference in this case is 0.3, and the causal risk ratio in this case is uh, 2.0, right? So for this second strata, the second stratum of the population, you have non-null uh, average causal effects, right? So this is a difference between uh, the original data set, if you want, and this data set, which can be seen as part of the same population, but stratified, right? They, uh, they are disjoint sets of the population. And the thing in this case is that you can conclude that V is an effect modifier, of the effect of A on Y, right? Because if you stratify uh, the, the two groups, you can conclude that you have an average causal effect that is different from one group to another. And that means that B is affecting the outcome of the final, of the final uh, results, right? uh, the final analysis. So in this sense, uh, B is, a, is an effect modifier of the whole population of the gods that we had before. And however, they, they mentioned that you also have to keep in mind that that doesn't mean that B is the cause of, uh, of a certain effect. So this is what they mentioned as, um, I think it was uh, surrogate effect modifiers versus, uh, I think it's direct. Uh, I don't remember that. I, I think it's something like direct effect modifiers, right? 
So V can be just a marker, a marker variable to uh, define a causal effect onto a population. So the, the example that they give is maybe the heart surgery is better in Greece, in Greece than in Rome. So in this case, uh, you have uh, that the treatment, uh, yeah, the risk ratio, uh, the risk ratio is twice what you had before. So maybe the, the surgery is worse in Rome in this case. So V is just a marker in that case, but it can also be like a variable uh, to affect the final results. So uh, that's uh, an important distinction here. So this is something that is highly related to further chapters in the book. Uh, when we talk about uh, causal models, um, uh, the, the same way uh, they discuss in other books, but V can be just uh, as a way of uh, conducting that uh, influence. Okay, and just a quick uh, a quick note. They also uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. They also describe the effect on the treated. Okay. I'm just going to be very brief because this is like a side note on the chapter, but it's going to be important for, for later contents in the, in the book as well. So the effect on the treater, the effect on the treater can be seen as uh, the effect that the treatment had on the population that was treated. So the, the counterfactual analysis on just the treated population. And you can also do the same for the untreated. untreated. So um, you say that the effect on the treated is not null when you have this thing over here. And by consistency, you can also substitute this and just put this over here. It's the same thing, right? This is the effect on the treated. This is something that we are not going to use much, but they are going to use in later chapters. So I think it's important just to point it out and that's it. If you think about the diamond diagram that they had in original, uh, in the Second chapter, I think, where you have the treated here and the untreated. Uh, this is just comparing uh, this whole part of the diagram versus this whole part of the diagram untreated. Okay, this is what we are discussing here, and the opposite would be just discussing this over here. This is the effect on the untreated. Right? And both of them can be easily computed if you want uh, using standardization and inverse probability weighting. I can, uh, I, I can give you the, the exact formulas that they provide, but I think it's uh, of no use here because they don't use this uh, in any other point in the chapter, right? So this is just a side note, so I'm going to leave it here. We're going to continue. I don't know if you have any, any questions. Excuse me, uh, what could be the interest of this measure? Uh, um... The effect of the treated? Yes. To actually know uh, what is the the precise effect that the treatment had on the treated you know, the treated group in this case. So I, I think we're going to see this better when we have uh, further examples in, in later chapters as well. Uh, but it's just okay. uh, trying to study if the response for each of the groups is different somehow uh, because of a different distribution of markers in a treated group. And maybe they have a different distribution of underlying effect modifications. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank We're you. going to see this further in, in later chapters. So, uh, we'll do speed up a little bit. They also discuss a lot of things uh, about transportability, which is the main reason why we are talking about effect modifications. So, Transportability is 
being capable of extracting conclusions from one group and putting them into a, a different group, right? And the thing is, transportability. which is also called sometimes external validity. So lack of transportability usually means lack of external validity, uh, allows you to transport, again, the conclusions in one group to another group, which is something that you're mostly interested when you want so to talk about. this would be from Greeks to Romans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the thing is, Transportability is hugely dependent on the knowledge of the task and the knowledge of the experts and the precise question. And they go on arguing about how you have to define precisely the measure, because again, effect modificators de uh, depend uh, on the measure selected. And they also depend on uh, how you choose to do uh, the, the stratification in these cases. Okay, so the thing is, transportability they mention, of course, is going to depend on certain factors. And they're going to depend on the distribution of effect modificators or modifiers, um, versions of the treatment, and interference. Right? So yeah. transportability is going to depend between. between uh... Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so transportability between two groups are going to depend on differences on the distributions of these three things between groups, right? So if in a group we have a different distribution of effect modifiers than in another, it, it will depend, it, it will um, affect transportability of a conclusion. The same goes for versions of the treatment. So for example, the heart surgery in Rome is performed differently than in Greece. So we have to take into account that and be aware that that may affect transportability and also interference, because maybe if we are transporting a conclusion, they mention, uh, for example, the benefits of conducting exercise. So if you are transporting a treatment of making a population do exercise and the second population is more socially active, for example, they may get more people involved in, in doing exercise. So they may compromise or may, may uh, have different effects, uh, dis different cautional effects between populations. So you may have different levels of interference between two populations, right? Or, uh, or at all. I mean, I mean, usually you assume that you don't have interference, but if you have interference, you may have different levels of interference between uh, populations, right? So, uh, I'm just going to leave it here. And transportability, again, depends strongly on the knowledge of the task at hand and uh, the precise question that we're going to try to answer, right? And they mention uh, that stratification it can be used to uh, as a form of adjustment. But it's it has some caveats. It has some it has some different uh, properties now. So as a form of adjustment, stratification works differently uh, than inverse probability weighting and standardization. So uh, when you have standardization and uh, inverse probability weighting, they estimate the causal effects for the whole population, right? But uh, Stratification usually estimates causal effects conditioned on a certain, a certain variable, right? So um, in most cases, you have to uh, define, of course, the, the measures in, the, in each case, but you have to obtain the causal effect for each of the strata that you have in your population. So you cannot escape uh, conditioning uh, in each of the effect modifiers in this case and in the variables that uh, allow you to have exchangeability, conditional exchangeability. So let me just uh, write it down here. So can be used to adjust for a, a variable, for example, L, um, 
but you have to uh, you end up with conditional effect measures for each strata. So just to be a little bit more clear, in the example of the Greek gods and the Roman gods, you are going to end up with four strata. If you want to perform uh, adjust, if you want to adjust for L using the stratification, you have to separate everything. You end up with four strata. Two of them are going to be for Greek gods and two of them for Roman gods. And for each one of them, you're going to have L equal one and L equal zero. So you end up with four different strata. The important thing here is you end up with one strata per um, per each level of the variables that allow you to have conditional exchangeability plus the variables that you're uh, strat stratifying by. So since V in this case is binary and L is also binary, you end up with four in this case. But you cannot escape conditioning or separating on these variables. You cannot escape this. Stratification doesn't allow you, for example, to obtain just the causal effect of uh, the treatment on Roman gods, because you have to have the severity, the, the severity of the prognosis as well, which allows you the conditional exchangeability. So L, L variable, which is the one that provides you conditional exchangeability, has to be conditioned for, in this case, has to be separated uh, in this case. That is important. So you end up with a lot of different strata. You cannot do this just for V and forget about L. If you want to do that, you do this in this case, as, as we done, as we have done before, right? That is also important. And they finally, uh, I'm just going to do the, the last part of the chapter. Uh, they talk about matching. So again, which is a highly related uh, technique that some of you already may know. Uh, matching population, matching, matching, pair matching and set matching as well. So you can also use matching as adjustment. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, matching. It's a fairly popular uh, technique again in uh, in causal uh, in causal inference as well, but in many other uh, analysis they they conduct this type of uh, things. So the idea behind matching is constructing a hypothetical population, which is a subset of the original population, by sampling in a smart way and guaranteeing that is the key thing here you guarantee in that new population that you have unconditional uh, exchangeability so you end up with full exchangeability across groups across groups of different treatments and let me just uh, show you an example so again we're going to construct a match population and we're going to talk about uh, the the examples of the Greek gods. Okay, so if you remember, we had a different uh, different number of instances of severe prognosis and uh, non-severe prognosis, if you want. So for each uh, for each individual with no treatment and no severe prognosis. Sample randomly an individual with, uh, I think it's directly, yeah, they do it the other part afterwards. So for each individual with no treatment and no severe prognosis, sample, uh, sample randomly another individual that had treatment not a uh, not severe prognosis as well. So you end up with a 50-50 split in this case. You can do this in another type of proportion. So for example, two for this and one of these, if you have fewer fewer data, for example. But this is like the, the basic uh, way of matching this population. And you can do the same 
In this case, right, you can do the same thing. So for each individual that had no treatment but severe prognosis, sample one individual with treatment and severe prognosis. So be aware that the thing that you are doing here is actually constructing a population that has the same distribution of treatment across, uh, across prognosis. The main problem that we had before is that the treatment had different proportions for the people with severe prognosis and light prognosis, right? So for the, for the people with severe prognosis, we had more treatment, a higher proportion of the treatment. And for the people with lighter prognosis, you had less proportion of treatments, right? So that's what we thought that was, uh, that was reasonable again. Now, what you're doing here is se selecting a subset of the population that has the same uh, split between uh, treatment and non-treatment cases. So you're changing this point 75 to... Right. Point yes, yes. That is equivalent of choosing a population that has both of those probabilities equal to one another. Are we all in the same page? So we are... Uh, but this is after you have done the first... Uh, after collection, yes, 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 yes. You, you've done the data collection and then you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine that you have this data, original data, and you see that there is a difference on the probability of assigning, assigning a, a treatment between the two prognosis uh, populations. So you think that you can construct that population over here. And just as a quick uh, note, we are doing this in this way instead of the other way because we could do the uh, we could do this the other way around, right? We can do this a equal one here and sample a equal zero in the other way. So that is two ways of constructing a match population. In this case, it's said to be the untreated match population, if you want. So. Take this with a with a grain of salt because they they use this to estimate uh, to estimate untreated causal effects. Okay, uh, causal effects in the untreated population. And if you do it the other way around, they use this to estimate treated causal effects, right? Or causal effects in the treated population. So the the key thing here is that if you do this right, you end up with unconditional, well, or marginal if you want. Exchangeability. Yes. No, maybe this is a stupid question, but you get unconditional exchangeability in this uh, new population. Right. But then how do you translate whatever you you understand of this population into the original one? Right. Right, one right, right, right. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, actually. Uh, in general, you answer different questions with this match population than the, than the questions that you had originally with the, with the initial population. Because in this case, you're talking about this untreated match population. It's not the same thing. You have to be aware of that. But the thing is, in this population, it's very easy to, to do calculations because you have a marginal exchangeability, so you can consistently estimate everything and everything works fine. Uh, but yeah, it's it's an important question, and I'm going to touch on it uh, briefly at the at the final part. Uh, I'm not going to extend too much because uh, it's already time. So, uh, yeah, but this is what they what they talk about, what they what they mention when uh, you talk about matching populations. And you can do this one to one, or you can do this one to many. So it can be one to a set, for example. And you, the important thing here is that you end up with a subset of the population that allows you to do these uh, calculations, right? And you can also do this uh, in a frequency uh, setup on which you sample uh, until this uh, becomes a 70% of your population. I mean, I'm not going to go into detail on that, but you can do this in many different ways. Maybe it's more convenient uh, for you. Now, uh, one, one important thing and one last uh, note here about matching is that matching ensures positivity. Because if you don't have people in one of the two groups, you're, not, you're never going to sample a, a pair 
right? If you have zero people with, for example, this instance over here, you you're going to end up with a population with no samples in there, right? So this ensures positivity. The, the people that you have here, the individuals you select, ensure positivity. At least you have one, okay? And that's, that subset of the population is going to be just one sample, yes. right? And let me just, uh, to finalize, uh, to erase this thing, I think. And they end up precisely with a discussion on the differences between the techniques that we have discussed today and previous days, and what do they imply uh, when talking about the, the data that you have which is precisely the question now. So on the one hand, uh, when you have standardization or inverse plurality weighting, again, I'm going to get you bored, but this is the, the, the thing that we have this, uh, discussed so far. So this is for the whole population. And the, the stratification method, uh, which, by the way, can also be done just in the strata you are uh, you're interested in. In that case, it's called restriction. Um, certification or matching is just used for a subset of the population. Right? Again, restriction is just doing certification for one particular strata or uh, a, a group of particular strata here. Now, all of them require positivity and exchangeability, but the group on which they require both conditions differs. So if you want to uh, use any of them, uh, for example, if you want to use this uh, in a conditionally randomized experiment, you may need a conditional exchangeability. But if you want to perform a stratification or matching, you may only need it in a subset of the population, <laughs> not just across all of the different uh, the, the different strata that define the variable that allows conditional exchangeability. You may only need it in certain strata, right? But if we go, if we use step two, if we use procedure two, yeah, isn't there a way? to weight the different strata to get the exact same result as we would get in one. Yeah, that's... I am getting... I think I'm getting something really confused, maybe something simple, uh, because you're just weighting things, right? If you use a different... Yeah. If you use a set of weights, you said we have L and V, right? And we have yeah. to compute the effect in each one of those four. Mm -hmm. But if you weight them appropriately, yeah, don't you end with the thing you, end, you get in one? That is true, but it depends on the case. So, for example, in each strata, maybe the weight is different uh, by the number of population that you have there or by different effects on different strata. For example, if you have these conditions that we mentioned over there, so the, the distribution of effect modifiers may differ from uh, in different strata. The, you may have different versions of the treatment uh, talking in different strata, for example, the, the surgery case. So. That's true. I mean, what you're asking is uh, is correct. I mean, you can weight them and try to reconstruct an effect on the overall population, but that's not as simple as it sounds. But uh, just because you have to be aware of possible differences that may allow you or may not allow you to properly weight them, actually, because of different effects that you may have. Uh, that That is also talking about transportability, if you want, in some sense. Actually, they, they mentioned they, they have a key a key point in the in the chapter that you can when you try to estimate the causal effect, uh, you try to do it as precisely as you can. So one way of uh, improving your chances of transportability and one way of estimating better a causal effect is trying to estimate it in different strata. So it's like more focused on different strata. So you perform a causal effect analysis on each of the subsets of the group. But uh, then to try to recombine all of those into the overall population, that is only uh, available if you have uh, if you fulfill certain conditions. 
that is that is also mentioned and that is also used in many cases but you have to be aware that you have to make certain assumptions such as uh, there is uh, no effect modifiers different versions of the treatment and so on but say you do with mm -hmm. by appropriately weighting the different and the different estimates seems something that sounds concrete or specific right the inverse probability weighting seems to be constructing uh -huh. an ideal population that right. did not exist at all so i mean maybe this is just me getting it completely wrong but i think i can understand what we are doing in two mm -hmm. but what we are doing in one seems some sort of platonic exercise in mm -hmm. like where am i getting it from uh, so if inverse probability weighting confuses you a little bit more yeah you can think about a standardization which maybe is clearer so you but have it's, it's the same thing after all. right I yeah mean, yeah just multiply it's equivalent it same. yeah yeah exactly so but the thing is in standardization you can see that it's just the product of the it's just if you want it's like a marginalizing a variable here so a propensity uh, score so if you remember uh, i think I okay remember. yeah yeah so in, in standardization you have uh for a counterpart 12 you have this right mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. this, which is in some sense, is very similar to what you're talking about. So this is just weighting something that is stratified somehow. Yeah, yeah, this is this is true. And in this case, what you're doing is just uh, introducing a over here, kind of, right? So you're just not removing uh, this different strata that you're uh, obtaining. So what it's missing here is just conditioning on V. And that is the things that you introduce over here, right? And the, and I'm talking about your original question as well. Uh, the thing is, if you think about the example of the, of the Greek gods between the male and female gods, you can see that um, the two effects weight each other out. So the effect on the overall population of the treatment was zero, but the effect on each group was non-null. It was different from zero, right? So in that sense, uh, you have a causal effect on each group different uh, from zero, which are weighting each other out and produce a final uh, zero causal effect. Right, so that is true in this case because it's an ideal population which fulfills all of the criteria that we defined before, and they have the same amount of uh, people in two populations with the same type of distribution. So the the weighting part in real experiments is much harder to do. Right, so you have to assume a lot of things in order to to do that, and. Precisely on, on this matter as well, uh, so highly, highly related to this. Uh, so we have a lot of different measures right now, right? So they, they provide an example on which they estimate, I'm not going to write it down so we are not stalled here forever, but uh, you can, for example, use the causal risk ratio and try to estimate uh, different causal risk ratios using different techniques, right? And um, for a given population, standardization and inverse probability weighting are going to give you, for example, let me just do it this way. This is what we are used to in the original standardization formulation and inverse probability weighting. A stratification is going to provide conditionals in both factors here. For example, with V equal one, I do not care. Uh, well, no, L equal one, uh, for example. Zero. And matching.
is going to provide something very similar, but in this case, conditioning on the treatment. For example, in zero, I don't really care if the treatment is zero. I mean, in this case, I'm imposing treatment zero because we are talking about the untreated matched population. If you want to do the opposite, you have to sample the other way around, right? So you see that you have, with the same idea of a causal risk ratio, if you use different techniques, you end up with different quotients here, different, different fractions. So the implication of each of these fractions is different, right? And especially, so this is, just one. I mean, you can estimate it however you want. This is just one. You don't have any, any other uh, numbers to estimate here, right? Here you have two, at least, because I'm stratifying for L in this case. So you have L equal one and L equal zero. So you end up with two quotients here, two, two numbers. And in this case, you can also have two. If you do matching for the untreated or matching for the treated. So if you end up with two quotients depending on how you perform the match, right? And each one of these fractions is going to give you a different result, but it doesn't mean that the conclusions uh, differ from, from one another. So in the, in the process example, if you want, this gives uh, 0.8, this gives, uh, with L equal one, it's 0.5, with L equal zero is uh, 2.0, and this is 1.0, right? So this means different things, of course. I mean, in this case, we're talking about the overall effect on the population. In this case, we're talking about the effect on each of the strata, on which you can see that for one strata, it, it uh, multiplies by two, it doubles the, the probability of death in this case. Well, yeah, the probability of death. Uh, and in another, uh, in another case, it halves it. And in this case, it shows that for the, for the untreated population, when you perform matching, for the untreated population, the, the effect on the untreated, that is the, the thing, I think we have here, yeah. So the effect on the untreated, which is precisely this, is no. It's, the, the causal risk ratio is equal to one. So we are talking about different aspects of different parts of the population. So uh, just uh, to sum up, because I'm not going to end uh, with uh, more technical details, I think there's uh, an interesting calculation as well, using the conditional risk ratios to obtain the whole population risk ratio that is also included in the, in the chapter. And it's just a matter of using exchangeability, but I'm not going to go into details. If you want, it's one of the last uh, fine points of the chapter. I think it's interesting. But just as a, as a quick note to, to finalize the chapter, um, each of these talk about different things. So the important thing is to define precisely what population are we talking about and what kind of question are we talking about. So not just the causal measure that we're going to use to define causal effect, but also the population because they are, they are talking about different populations. This is talking about the untreated population. This is talking about strata of the severe prognosis and life prognosis. And this is talking about the overall population. So not just measure, because this is the measure we're using in every single case, but also it's important to be precise about the population, the precise population that we're talking about. That is the, the keynote of, the, of the, the chapter, right? The whole thing is just very similar to what you would do like in, uh, in the original, uh, without uh, even knowing about uh, causal inference. They also talk about um, the fact that we understand a just for L, a stratification for L, but it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as well. It's, uh, it's a point that you have to be aware when you see all of these things. Usually commonly, we talk about stratification in the same way as adjusting, but adjustment is what is done in standardization and inverse probability weighting. So that's like a, a technical caveat there. So I don't know if you have any questions on the chapter or in Zoom. I don't know if there are any questions. No, none that I can see. So I'm sorry for going over time. Uh, 
with a review of the previous chapters and so on. So getting back to David's question, so this chapter seems to be a sort of generalized solution to the Simpson paradox. Right. Answer. Yes. Yes. I do think so. They they don't mention the Simpson paradox. They don't mention it, right? Yeah. 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 I. I. Well, they they are setting it up actually, but they just want to provide like a neutral or the the most neutral points of stratification that they can. They they are very very adamant on providing uh, neutral expressions for the the estimation of the causal effects in uh, all of these cases. And they actually don't talk in in most cases. They don't talk about uh, effect modification. I think in, yeah, effect modifications. They most of the time refer to this as uh, effect heterogeneity on the on the treatment. So they don't talk about uh, effect modification. They try just they just try to provide the most neutral general definitions. And they I, I think this is just. Uh, a matter of laying out the groundwork before they, they go into Simpsons, uh, Simpsons paradox, uh, paradox. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if there are any further questions. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we continue next week with Chema, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, with chapter five. Uh, chapter six is Roy's or yours? Right. It's yours, no? And we need volunteers for seven and eight. Yeah, we need volunteers or randomized uh, conditionally. <laughs> you you volunteer for chapter seven? Well, I have yet see chapter seven, so <laughs> I want to say it before. I, I, I the, the sooner you volunteer, the easier it is. So, <laughs> chapter one that's is the true. easiest. And that's true, that's true. So if you want to volunteer for any chapters, or if you read something interesting about a uh, personal inference and you want to show it off, uh, just awesome. So write down. An email to any of us, and we can we can uh, see. Okay, awesome.